I noticed you guys are eating lunch too. <laughs> I don't need to have my video. I don't need to have my video on, but I just wanted to say, hey, Dick. Hey, Sandra. Hi to all. Hello, all. It's good mm -hmm. seeing, you. seeing you, Sandra, and seeing you, Cindy. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? okay? I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our next speaker today. And this will be Dick Montanez, our chaplain here at Sanford. His areas of ministry include palliative care and COVID. He has a master of science chaplaincy from Loma Linda University. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Theology from Union, or rather Pacific Union College. And Dick is originally from San Francisco and a recent transplant uh, prior to that from San Bernardino, if I'm getting that correct. And then he has now obviously here in Sioux Falls. His activities he enjoys are fishing, um, watching Marvel movies, sports and science fiction. And Dick, if there's anything else, please feel free to add it. But I'm really excited to hear him uh, speak today and um, a deep gratitude for being willing to do so. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dick Montanez, as was introduced chaplain at Sanford. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here with y'all today and um, to kind of share some perspectives of end of life care from an African American perspective. Um, and I, I hope um, this would be an opportunity for us to learn and grow together. So what I like to do first is kind of share a story. Um, I was 21 years old and I was seeing my girlfriend at the time who would eventually become my wife, now ex. And we were over in her house in um, the East Bay about 45 minutes east of San Francisco. And, um, you know, we're in that lovey-dovey phase and um, we're wrestling on the couch and I fall off the couch onto her arm, onto my ribs and I felt one of my ribs kind of bow in and then pop back out. It was very painful. And um, that uh, um, flared up my asthma, which wasn't very well managed at the time. Had to go to the ED. And um, in the ED, um, I had a um, doctor come in. He barely looked at me. After he looked at me the first time, he didn't really look in my eyes um, anymore. Um, you know, asked me what was going on and everything. 
Um, very disinterested, I, I'll be completely frank. Um, and after I told him what happened, he put his hand on my rib with the two fingers and he jabbed him. He'd even press him, his hand, he jabbed him in real quick and then pulled him out. And um, I flinched and looked at him because I thought it was kind of unusual somebody just to jab their finger in. He didn't touch it, he didn't press, he jabbed. And then he, he said, um, real quick, gave me a prescription for um, albuterol for my asthma and told me to take some ibuprofen and walked out. He was in there less than five minutes. And um, it was very impersonal um, and a couple of factors um, played in. I didn't have insurance at the time. And um, I was in a part of the um, San Francisco Bay Area that didn't have a lot of people that looked like me. And so I have held on to that experience because it was very unfriendly. The doctor um, was white. And though I can't say that race had anything to play with it when as a 45, excuse me, 44 year old black man now in America, race kind of has everything to do with things in American culture, it seems like nowadays. And those things even trickle into um, our healthcare system. And the reason why I bring up that experience is that I did not feel like I got very good care from the doctor. I did not feel like that the doctor was really concerned about me as an individual and did not take a, a, any time to really come into my experience in and out. And, and since I've held on to that experience, every time I go into the ED, I am very suspicious of the medical staff and I work in the hospital. I mean, there are other hospital experiences that I've had as well and things that I've witnessed, but I developed a mistrust of the hospital system and that experience and also hearing the experience from my mom and my grandpa and, and different people within, within um, my family. And so when I was thinking about end of life care, because I do a lot of end of life um, care at Sanford, and I was asked to, to really speak about that. The literature is really, really, really clear um, about one specific thing. And I would say the mistrust between the African American um, community and the medical community at large. And this plays out heavily actually in end of life care. And, and the perception of, I would say most African-Americans is that the healthcare system and the quality that is received are not good. There is um, plenty of documentation through, um, through the literature that talks about um, the health disparities. But I, I think the biggest the biggest thing as, as a black man that I bring through my own experience is that I do not trust institutions and systems. I'll just be completely, completely authentic about that. So in my own ministry, in my own work, I try to, I try to, to build trust because I trust so little. And some of the things that, um, I'm going to, I'm going to send in the chat right now to everybody, really the, um, if I can get this thing working, the, um, the four articles that, um, that I read and all of them dealt with trust. And one of the, um, as a, as a chaplain in a Christian tradition, one of the things that really stood out was this Bible verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Now, the reason why I bring that up is that among other things within the African-American tradition, 
religion and spirituality play a great part. And, and so I, I wrote down four, four things that I would say from an African-American perspective, when you think about inner life care. So the first one, it was mistrust. But the, um, the second one is the family and close friends. So um, an individual at end of life themselves will rarely make any decisions without consulting their family and close friends. And within African-American families, because of their dynamics, I would say that the loudest voice is gonna be the female voice and it's the oldest members of the family. Number two, excuse me, number three, is um, the spiritual community themselves that the patient belongs to. Spiritual leaders are oftentimes advised um, when it comes to um, medical decision making. And so a person's spiritual group and their spiritual leader will often be involved in some capacity. I, I wrote this as my own observation and reflection as far as really within the African-American tradition and belief is what constitutes the soul. Um, and I think that that really is very heavily connected to the physical temporalness of our bodies. And um, lastly, I think there, there is the, the lack of education and, and formal um, conversations about what individuals want for end of life care. People don't sit around the table ever having this conversation about, about end of life care from a hospital perspective. I can just be completely authentic and open about that. And so those are the five perspectives from an African-American. Um, those are f um, five things that I've noted from an African-American perspective that I've read in the different different literatures and, and, and everything. And so um, as a hospital chaplain um, doing a spiritual assessment, one of the things that I would be looking for is um, trying to figure out who are the different members of the tribe, as I like to call it, who are these people's people? Who are the, the people in the family when it comes to the to a black family and that could be anybody. Literally, it could be the nuclear family, it could be blood relatives, it could be very, 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 very close friends. For myself, um, recently um, I, I was divorced in 2018 and I was talking to members of our own palliative care team about that and about COVID and some of my concerns as I've watched our families agonize making decisions um, about people who have been intubated and not having a voice. And, um, and these conversations are not being had or not being made. And so I did for myself, I did an advanced directive and which is not very common among um, African Americans to do an advanced directive, but I did an advanced directive when I was married. Um, I've been in healthcare for 22 years, and um, and so I I did one again, specifying um, who I want to make decisions. So my my first person is my my eldest son. I'm not married anymore, so my eldest son is my number one person. He's 21 years old. And I put my secondary person on my events directive as my best friend. He is literally like my brother. I have a brother and a sister by blood. My, um, my best friend, Manny, would be considered like the third sibling in my eyes that I have. He is my number two person. And on my events directive, I made sure that my son 
talks to him about making any decisions. You will often find within African-American um, communities that the um, different members of the family, even non-family members are ones who are giving input and having powerful sayings and what goes on. And this is completely different from really the model that we have um, in the, the medical model that we have. We, we're really focused in on the individual and the individual's needs and really talking to the individuals. And though we do have different specialties to assist the family, it's really individualized. And, and when you deal with um, an African-American patient, you are really dealing with the full um, family unit. And so uh, one thing that would be important is asking and or eliciting, um, elicit um, cultural beliefs and, and finding out who these people are, who are these people's people, who, who are the people that, um, that you depend on. And that's, in, and that's including um, really finding out what, um, what the patient's spiritual background is, what their involvement in their spiritual community, and if their minister knows already of what's going on um, in the patient's case. Um, since palliative care is um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, the chaplain, which, which would be me, would, would reach out to the minister um, with the family's permission. And I, I think that that's really important in building that, really building that bridge between community and institution, community and medical center. Um, but I think because of just really this understanding of, of, of black spirituality and really this preciousness about breathing in the soul, um, as a black man throughout the history of this country, we ha I have not, looking at it from a historical perspective, had control over my own body. You know, um, African Americans have gone from slavery to um, to freedom with limited rights and fighting through civil rights and civil rights and civil rights to and um, throughout that that experience and even now, even in 2020, it's this this feeling almost of helplessness of control over over my body at times and at end of life care there it's as long as the body is still alive the soul is kind of still there so you'll often see in a life um that african americans will often look for aggressive treatment during end of life and the aggressive treatment it is not consistent with palliative and hospice philosophies, generally speaking, especially the hospice philosophy on um, aggressive care. And the, the, those conversations can be difficult. If there are any medical options whatsoever, if there is even the remote possibility in the African-American perspective, we're gonna go for that because that with that slim hope and the belief in, in an all-powerful God, which is very much another spiritual component of um, African-American belief is that God ultimately is the one who decides who lives and who dies. And so pursuing aggressive care as long as possible, having a person alive as long as possible, giving God the opportunity to see his will manifested through this person's life. It could be agonizing to actually watch as, um, and I've seen it, watch a, a patient suffer because of, of, of the belief of, if I just hold on just a little bit longer, that miracle will come. And sometimes that kind of, sometimes that belief is not even um, originates within the person because 
the family will make a decision together. That belief might be somebody within the family and the patient is echoing that belief. They may not hold that belief, but because they hold themselves within this family group and that this family group is making this decision together, then they will, will feel guilty if they want to want to withdraw care want to not do aggressive care anymore because they feel like um, they're letting the family down or, or so I just want to, to be mindful of that as well is that is that sometimes a patient wants to go comfort care, but the family does not and really, really to navigate that and kind of respect the family involvement, even at times where it seems unreasonable, we go through our steps. We have our steps on how we we work and um, we work with our families. And sometimes we have to escalate things, but to be completely authentic, being confrontational with a black family doesn't do any, will absolutely shut down dialogue. It's like, he's like, as long as you can keep dialogue open, that's a beautiful thing. But as soon as confrontation occurs, there will be this withdrawal because it's always going to be the perception that I'm going to get less care. I did not get all the care possible. I didn't get all the best options possible before we made it to end of life. And I, so now I'm at end of life. I've got these people in my room talking about comfort care, talking about stop fighting, and they don't look like me oftentimes. And I already believe I didn't get the best care possible. So I think an important thing is to make sure that you're communicating, keep, even if it doesn't seem like it's falling on deaf cares, to really um, communicate as much and provide as much information as possible, even if it feels like it's going nowhere. Because that communication is a line of trust that you're building within the African American family. And so respect to family involvement and keeping communication open is um, I, I think very important for end of, of overcoming any barriers when it comes to end of life, end of life care. So I think finally, and that goes into the education piece overall, um, there, I was reading the article, Perceptions of Inner Life Care um, Differ Sharply Between African American and White American. And one of the things that it really pointed out was an overall like addressing like things on a policy level. And so, one of the things that could be addressed on a policy level um, when addressing different barriers for end of life care is like spiritual care departments, um, visiting um, different um, spir um, spiritual communities within the community that are African-American, largely African-American and, um, and building relationships not only with the clergy, but the, um, also along with um, palliative care team, maybe um, give informationals during, um, during service time as allotted, or to be able to give information to churches and, um, and mosques and various places of worship, um, information on, on palliative care itself. So really building that relationship with that minister so that that minister understands what palliative care what end of life care is from the institution, therefore helping them be involved in the education of their congregants. And, okay, so, so those are areas of, of building trust. And I, I will come back to the number one thing with African-American perception of inner life is this mistrust that we have gotten here because I did not get good care in the past. 
Now, when somebody comes to palliative care, comes to our comes to us in palliative care, no matter where they are, we are collecting their journey from all the other providers before us. And we, it's from a, an African American perspective, if we, we may have to start with a clean slate and, and really acknowledge that we have no control over what was done in the past, but this is, this is where the plan is now and how can we build, how can we build that, um, that trust now? What can we do now? And it's gonna be, it's painful to hear that, but sometimes from the very beginning, we have to build that trust and it should be, it, it should be st being straightforward. Um, and even if it's not well received, at least, at least the family has heard what's going on. I think we just have to be authentic and transparent. It's like, you're asking me as a black man to trust an institution that is a part of a larger narrative, a larger story that hasn't always treated me right. And so it's not on our patients to just give trust. It's actually us on us as providers to build that therapeutic alliance. And that work is gonna be the most important work that you will do with a black patient and their families is building that trust being concerned about really concerned about different family dynamics as they um, as they pop up in the patient's story because the family unit is very important in making decisions that support whether it be through your through, your, through social work or mental health or spiritual care really addressing the patient's psychosocial needs are, are going to be very important in building that trust making sure that chaplain unless unless absolutely not wanted by the family making sure that the chaplain is involved in the patient's care making sure the social worker is involved in the patient's care because those psychosocial things are going to help the patient have a good death you have to change our mindset of what a good death means for a black family you know Maybe a good death is making sure that that the son who's been disconnected from his children have that contact with them as they're dying. Even if we're doing everything that seems very unreasonable, because for that patient, reconciliation is absolutely going to be important before they go to the afterlife. So as providers, um, doctors, everybody, listen for the family dynamic portion of it. That will be very important when um, decision-making has to occur, whether we're talking about code status. Um, and I think finally, as I, as I think about the issue, the issue of, um, of mistrust and trust in general that that we as an institution have to continue to um, self-examine ourselves on our own attitudes towards the different people that we service. It's like, I have to do this every single day when I minister to people, because I minister to pe people from all walks of life from all looks, from all um, different religious um, perspectives. And I have to always examine my own practice um, in light of a person's um, and their cultural beliefs. I always have to examine that for myself because I feel like that that's one aspect of a person that I have, that, that I can respect as they come in. I may not agree with, and our institution may not agree with, and we may not be able to accommodate. 
but we can respect that this person, this patient and his family thinks different than we do. And so I think that that examination will allow us to build trust because then I really think the most important thing with end of life care period is being able to get into that space with somebody and let them know that wherever this journey is, we're gonna do it together. And I have to trust you to have you in my space because it's very sacred, me dying. It's very sacred when grandma dies. It's very sacred when my son dies or my daughter dies, my aunt, my uncle, or my best friend forever dies. It's sacred. So I gotta trust you to be in that space that you're gonna do what's best for me. And sometimes it's building that trust and even banging, we're banging your head, you're banging your head, you're banging your head, but you've spent the time and you've invested the time building the trust that when you get to the absolute end of the road, the family can look at you and, and acknowledge that, you know, we didn't have the best, it wasn't always, it was up and down, but I know that you were there for us, that you weren't against us. So um, I don't really have anything more than that. Just remember, like, you know, I put like mistrust as the number one thing that a perception of end of life care. Just remember that when you're dealing with an African-American family and patient, that trust is gonna be probably the biggest thing that you're gonna have to work on building because it's with trust that education can occur. It's with trust that we can have the dialogue to move towards a good death. And that's ultimately what we want for our patients is to have a good death. Thank you. This is Sandra. I just wanted to thank, thank you, Dick, for, for your perspective and for the information that you've provided today. It's very insightful and I appreciate it. Hey, Dick, this is Ellie. Um, there's a question on the chat. I don't know if you can see that, but it says, do you have recommendations for building trust? I think the, um, the, the biggest thing in building trust is taking the time to ask the questions and to, for cultural humility. So being, being a learner instead of an expert. So when you go in there, yeah, you have all the medical information, but you don't know this person's journey. Ask questions, ask who are the people involved? What, um, how long have you gone through this experience? How can we how can we help you? Who are the people that we need to talk to? Have does your um, is your spirituality important to you? Is your spiritual um, you know just really asking really 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 personal questions and being open and available and being there to learn? I think the um, learning wanted to be a learner during the initial part, really trying to learn who these people are, is gonna go a long way on care down the road. Harry, did know. you have anything to add? I think you were emceeing this at the beginning. Say that again? I was just talking to, um, I wasn't sure who's supposed to be um, 
managing the dialogue here. That I mean, it was Dr. Peterson Henry. I um I will definitely invite any any questions that anybody has. Um, uh, we one of the things that went out to everybody was, do you have recommendations for building trust? So, I um I like to reflect that back to to the group here. Um, with your own experience, or what are so many things that you have done to build trust, and when when um, working with African-American families here at Sanford. Well, this is Ellie again. I don't know if this builds trust really, but I, I often being in ethics, I get involved at the very end where it's um, generally pretty thorny. And sometimes I just call it out. I just say, you know, I understand you don't have any reason to trust us. You don't know us. Um, but here's some things I can tell you and then try to talk through it. And I've even gone so far as to say, these are the people I would trust to make, help me make these decisions. These are the people, you know, my family would talk to, to try to give some sort of, or make some sort of, you know, relationship where, where there hasn't been one. I love that, Ellie, that what you said, like just really calling it out. I think that that goes a long way, actually calling it, calling out the situation for what it actually is. And, and, um, and then building relationship through your own personal journey and personal story. What I what I have found ultimately in um in thinking about my own ministry here at the hospital because I don't encounter a lot of African American patients. Um, uh, we have a, a, I encounter a lot. For me, I encounter a lot of Caucasian patients, which is not very unusual. But for me, I have encountered a lot of Native American patients. And as I was reading through some of the literature, it just kind of goes across similar experiences as learning, trying to really be a learner of the um, patient's cultural cultural belief um, and not assuming that you know, know something about somebody just because, um, oh, I did, I did, there was one thing that I wanted to, to address actually real quick is that um, when we talk about um, in a life care from an African-American perspective, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of things get clumped in there for when you say African-American. And so like in a place like South Dakota where you have a large immigrant population, you um, Af um, someone black here can be um, from Liberia or they could be from Chicago, or in my case, San Francisco, from you know their place of origin. And so, because of that, being an American, being native-born, or as opposed to being an immigrant, um, there there are different. There are definitely differences, even among the, um, someone being black and how they approach approach things. They're very, very things that are very, very similar, but um, the experience of racism in America wouldn't be something that would be understood as um, from a family perspective, as like a historical perspective, as opposed to someone like me who's been, who's native born, I was born, I'm an American. And so I've, this is my, my American ex experience. So they're there are differences as well here, and there are marked differences between whether a family is um, Christian or Muslim um, within like Christian faith, um, whether 
their Protestant or Catholic, all of these other things do mix in with that. But uh, there is a difference between being African American. I would say there's a difference between native born and non-native born. And those differences have to be also learned as well. So when I come into a room um, from, with a family, a, a black family, and they're from Africa, it's like, I have to learn because I don't know what it's like to be from Senegal or um, Sierra Leone or, or or from any any other many places that the our 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 black population come from. So I I have to find out that. I mean, sometimes their their language differences, and sometimes that are on top of that. And that's a, um, that's been an area of growth for myself because where I, where I came from, everybody uh, the large majority of people were native born. They were Americans, as opposed to being here, we had such a large black population that are born from somewhere else. So those are differences to keep in mind as well. Anything else anybody would like to share, have a question about, um, like me to further clarify? I would just say it sounds like um, the cultures within cultures is what you're describing. And it's good to be aware of that and the differences and in, in, in where the biggest ones are. Because I would say that depending on what country you come from, a doctor, so like a, a, the doctor in the position of, of a healer has, has a, a different significance than say me being born here in America. And so really trying to understand the cultural differences and beliefs and how that family interacts with medicine is very important. Anything else that I get that I can discuss or share with? Again, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time um, to, to, to teach us. We appreciate that. It was, it's truly an honor. Um, and a blessing to be able to serve in this capacity. I think that the more that we have these discussions in healthcare, just the, the better that we are for our patients overall. And I appreciate the time and the opportunity to be able to share. All right, thanks, bye-bye. Mm-hmm.